Hello again, I am Germana Gianquinto and I am the coordinator of the project AI for Public Policy and a senior consultant at GFD Italia. I have worked in the field of European research and innovation projects since many years in different fields from health to environment and ICT. Uh, today, we are here to uh, present this session on health and well-being. And uh, uh, what we would like to do in our session is to focus on this topic. That is why it is more and more urgent and more and more evident that efficient public services can make people's life easier. So the way citizens perceive public services is changing and the awareness of the public administration is surely adapting to this perception and trying to improve in it. The way citizens take advantage of public services must be easy and efficient. And therefore, the decision-making process of public administrations have to become, to become more agile, faster, and adaptive. If this has been clear since times, now it is really urgent. That is because you can all imagine that uh, we have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, affecting everyday life and affecting the way we take advantage of public services and technology deploying these public services. COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of people, health and social need and underline that it is now the time to address some long-standing challenges. Other than putting health of citizens as the first thing to take care of. Within this framework, luckily I would say, we are living on times where technology can really help us to improve. We have disruptive te technologies that can better support data-driven policies. We can think about digital twin, artificial intelligence, high-performance computing within the others, but there are many different te technologies to help us and assist us in this process. Considering that these technologies run on cloud, meaning optimization, a better and more focused management of data, as well as artificial intelligence set in place for extracting and deploying information, we can only start imagining the transformation that the public decision-making process will be soon facing, and most important, the opportunities that are behind this transformation. To support this transformation, we have different projects here, Policy Cloud, Decido, AI for Public Policy, Duet, and Intercom. All these projects have joined their forces to raise awareness on the European cloud infrastructure for public administration. In particular, in this track, we have the cluster focusing on health and well being and on the added value of a data driven policy making. I would like now to present to you the speakers that uh, will take care of uh, giving us their perception. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Paresa Marchianido. She is principal consultant at Technopolis Group. I would like to present her and then give her the floor and then I will run with the other speakers. So Dr. Paresa Marchianido is specialized in monitoring and assessment of science, innovation, and industrial policies. Paresa is leading on behalf of Technopolis Group in Telcom, designing the policy modeling framework. Paresa has designed STI indicators on numerous projects, going back to the ERA Watch, Trend Chart Initiative, Eco Innovation Scoreboard, ESPON's SDGs localizing tools for EU regions, the regional ecosystem scoreboard and advanced technology for industry monitoring framework, among the others. She has though a huge experience. I would like to leave her the floor. Hi everyone, can you hear me well? Can you see me? Let me share my screen. All right, so 
Hello, everybody. My name is Paresa. I'm very happy to be here with you. And I would like also to congratulate uh, the team for a very interesting uh, panel discussion that we had earlier during the plenary. What I would like to, to do in this coming 10 minutes is to describe to you uh, what we have been doing in Intelcomp and how we have been setting the framework for evidence-based policy modeling before I go into a description of what we have been doing specifically in the health domain. Before that, a bit about the Intelcomp platform to put it a bit of discussion in context, it, what is Intel in essence? It is a cloud platform that will offer AI-based uh, services on STI policy. It is designed and by definition to provide answers to policy questions that cover the whole spectrum of STI policy, and I will go get back to that later on. And it will also be tested in three specific domains, artificial intelligence, climate change, and health. And within health, the focus is specifically on cancer. The idea is that uh, it is co-created with public administrations and all the relevant stakeholders. And in fact, we have been now uh, finalizing year one by the end of this, this year. And the co-creation process will start in year two, where more the health domain experts will start to be engaged in the project which is the reason why I will also focus a bit more on the framework that we provide for this type of work to start. Um, it will basically be focusing on textual data, so not all types of data, and it will be using artificial intelligence techniques. And it doesn't start from scratch because it builds upon uh, the tools, the two tools that you see listed there, the corpus viewer and the data for impact. Now, in terms of objectives, what we are doing in the policy framework is to identify policy needs, which we do by means of policy questions. And then we identify specific measurements, which includes also indicators, but more big data oriented metrics uh, using open data repositories. And this is the step that we are currently undergoing and we will be closing by the end of this year. And then it's about building the solutions for the policymakers with the help and with a co-creation process with the, with the so-called living labs. Now, on the conceptual framework of, uh, of, of Intelcom that applies across the domains, it's hence domain agnostic. And this is a step we have added, a bit of a deductive approach, because we felt it was necessary to, uh, to check um, and to have a common framework among, among the different domains to base up ourselves upon while we are preparing for the work uh, that would only start in year two. Uh, so basically what we did with, is that we focused on these dimensions that you see there, those four dimensions, and we, um, uh, we chose to focus and to center our approach on, uh, um, on, the, the limit, on the functional delimitation of the innovation system with seven, the seven innovation functions. Then uh, we did look at what are the policy questions that are relevant for the different phases of the policy cycle. And then we considered also the different types of policy stakeholders, because it's one thing talking about the policy, STI policy analyst, and another thing talking about um, the, the mayor, and another thing talking about the funding agencies. And then we are moving slowly towards the point four, which is uh, um, basically reformulating, expanding the policy framework that we have uh, designed in terms of policy questions to domain specific questions that account for the, the specific technology, specific questions and stakeholder interactions that are very that are central for the specific domains. And as we know, in health, there is a lot of um, you cannot assume that you, if you have a domain agnostic framework that it applies one to one on, on all cases and all the data sources do not apply for our specific databases that are relevant for the domain of health. So these are the components that we are considering all together, but starting from a domain agnostic framework framework. In terms of the functions, uh, maybe some of you are familiar already with the literature on the uh, functions of the innovation system. We focus on those seven functions, which include entrepreneurial activity, knowledge creation, diffusion through networks, guidance, market formation, human and financial resources, and the creation of legitimacy. And in terms of the uh, phases of the um, uh, policy cycle. Uh, there, is, there is a lot of different approaches, but we did not want to overcomplicate Intelcom and we follow a very simple five phase model uh, that we apply in Intelcom. And what we do in essence is that we create the matrix of the functions and the phases, and we design policy questions um, that are of 
relevance to STI policymakers. And with that approach, we basically what we have done is that we have designed 160 domain agnostic questions. And in the process of discussing within the consortium and with interviews with STI experts, we realized that already at the very start of the project that there is a great interest, namely in the face of evaluation and agenda setting, which is also what we are focusing a bit more our effort. Um, now we are uh, in this phase two, let's say, of, uh, of the um, policy framework, we are looking into the measurements and data sources. And uh, this is a very interesting transition because we are translating the policy questions into measurements and eventually indicators. Now, we like to make this distinction between indicators and measurements, because when we talk about indicators uh, and in the, in the heads of the policymakers, and a KPI, an indicator, is a statistically robust measurement. Well, we know what when we are exploring with big data, we are we we before we actually can label uh, an in, a measurement as a KPI, there needs to be a lot of robustness checks of the data that need to take place. So we make this distinction between indicator and a measurement. And in order for a policy question, let's say to qualify for Intelcomp, we ask uh, the following questions: first, whether to answer to the policy question and to measure it in a specific way that we propose whether it requires AI intelligence, whether we can source sufficient data, whether it's also technically feasible, if it is in scope as per the domains. So we, we do take into account already the different domains, hence also health, and also later on for the so-called living labs. And is it in scope also as per the proposal and the vision that we had in the proposal for Intelcomp? Now, to make it maybe a bit clearer to you of what is in scope and what is out of scope for Intel Comp is that what is in scope is obviously questions that require AI intelligence, like what are the R&D fields of larger R&D investors? So you can argue you have the R&D industrial scoreboard, but you want to understand what are specifically the R&D fields that they are working on besides what you see in patterns in bibliometrics. So you can look at the um, uh, you can look, of course, at open air on the publication, you can look also on their website. So this is a classic case where AI intelligence is very useful. Policy questions for which we can source sufficient text data, which is sources like Parliament Discussion Minutes or TED or Euraxis, where you have a lot of rich material. Uh, policy questions which are complex but technically feasible. Uh, for instance, what has been the leverage of national support measures for EU competitive funding, which implies that you need to match the projects that can be funded by national sources to European, uh, European tenders and European projects that have been financed, potentially from the same organization. Uh, and then policy questions in scope for the three, three, three domains. So in our exercise that we've done in discussing also with the experts in the domains, uh, we saw that there was great emphasis on the diffusion of knowledge across the board for all the three domains. And it's an important piece of information for us to know as to what to prioritize in Intelcom, because as I said, we have 160 questions, so we also need to make some choices. Um, policy questions requiring AI intelligence that are not developed by other EU initiatives, which is practically also the reason why these events are very interesting also for us to understand what you are also doing and where we can share and build synergies between, uh, between the cloud projects. What is out of scope is projects um, is policy questions that require traditional statistical data. That's, I think, an evident one. Um, also, policy questions that have no sufficient text data or no good proxies can be designed. For instance, in the discussions with STI policymakers, there's a lot of interest in royalties. Unfortunately, there is no good data source for this. Uh, and another example is policy questions that require a holistic analysis and a mix of sources. So when we are looking at evaluation and we are looking at it at the program level, for instance, a lot of the policymakers say, yes, cost effectiveness or cost benefit. Uh, this is the key questions that I want to uh, AI uh, to provide an answer to. But this is a very holistic analysis and it's also out of scope for Intercom. Then policy questions that require statistical analysis, for example, when you actually, in order to respond to a policy, questions, a policy question, you do need partly AI, but you also need a counterfactual analysis to go along with it, which implies that you have to collect a lot more data um, uh, than, than also the, the, the AI-driven data, which is also one of those cases that we identify as being rather out of scope for Intelcomp. And then policy questions for which AI could be useful but there is a limited policy intelligence that can be offered. So when, when there is a very important question of what are the new markets, which you could look at using public consultation data, it's a bit limited as to how complete the answer could be using this, uh, this source, for instance. Or when you have questions of the scale-ups living the country, 
you can look at it by looking at news, but is it sufficient? So for those ones where there is a bit of a gray zone and we are not comfortable that we can provide really very interesting insights, while AI could be used, we opt, uh, let's say, against it. Um, then it, uh, what we have done is that for each of the policy questions, we identify sources and we are assessing the sources. In order to assess the sources, we look at their text mining potential, the temporal data availability, because for some questions, temporality is important, the availability of classifiers to be able to train the algorithms, uh, to have the open access versus paid access, because in Intelcomp we have a focus more on open access, and also the resources needed to compile the process. Again, as I said, choices need to be made as to how much, many more experimental um, sources we can we can embed within Intelcomp. And lastly, and I highlight it because as an STI policy practitioner, this is what I also very much care about. It's about the representativeness. What are the biases of the database? How can we address the biases to ultimately create KPIs? Um, now, in the domain of cancer, I know I kept you waiting for a while. What has been the approach on the domain of cancer? So we started uh, with a framework and then we, uh, we focused on performing some desk research on the identification of the STI, science, technology, and innovation policy needs. And uh, we, we, fought, we, we realized that in the domain of health, this is very much in uh, the hands of the national member states, but we, in order to, uh, to at, that, at that stage, in the first six months of the project, to get a, a good idea uh, about a, a framework that would fit also the policy questions that we would want to answer, give an answer to, we looked at what Europe is doing. And we looked at it by uh, performing a simplistic intervention logic. So we looked at the vision at the European level, we looked at the operational objectives, we looked at associated targets that we would be called to, um, uh, to, 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 to test whether we, uh, we are hitting the performance that is expected. Uh, we are looking at the different policy programs that are of relevance, the roadmap and the actions be below those roadmaps. And then, of course, since we look at it from an STI lens, the specific STI actions and initiatives and the STI expected outcomes. And this is what we have done up until now for the domain of cancer as a step one. As a step two, we conducted um, uh, stakeholder consultations, and this was at the end of month six of the project. And what we used was, of course, the evaluation, fr the, the framework that we had. In the domain of cancer, there was a lot of interest on evaluation. This is why I focus a bit more on that. Uh, and we, we discussed and debated about the formulation and the accuracy and the expansion that is needed in terms of the different policy questions. And there were some interesting insights that came out of these workshops, like the identification of new collaborations arising, the adoption and replicability of innovations to different healthcare systems, the advancements in technology technology readiness level, the TRLs of, of, uh, or interactive machine learning for different areas or projects. So there were a lot of also more niche areas that were, um, that were discussed during those workshops. We also, it helped us a bit to see clear what are the evaluation specific needs that they have. A lot of focus is of course on being able to capture well and from different angles, the health impact. Uh, comparing and measuring the qualitative impact and patient experience, and especially when it came to patients, having the possibility to monitor the patient outcome measures for a, a longer period, among others. And of course, then we were able to see also the STI more broadly priorities that uh, that existed in the cancer in the cancer um, cancer domain. Um, then as a, as a third step, and this is where it becomes very interesting for, uh, for this discussion and for Intelcom that will be able to present more concrete outcomes in the, coming, uh, in the coming year to come, is what is actually the prioritization that the living lab that we have on cancer is placing on. And we have some preliminary discussions uh, with, uh, with the living lab. And what it seems to be the case that there is a very a great interest that Intelcom should focus on evaluation to start with and the analysis of it, the impact of funded research projects the, the, and the way that they, they, they see it and where they see they, uh, their needs to be uh, the most dominant is about this first, second, the third level of, uh, of needs, the first level bit of the classical output uh, related approach where you have the classic um, outputs in terms of scientific publications, patents, but also clinical trials. Uh, then the, um, the outcomes in terms of um, the medical outcomes and hence more going towards the medical impact. It involves good practices, new treatments and new diagnostic screening techniques and also the impact in terms of uh, the social impact about media, about topics of funded projects that are discussed more in position papers 
in uh, uh, positioning of projects in relation to public health data. Uh, and these are all things that require different sets of data from traditional to more uh, new big data approaches for which currently there is uh, there is very limited usability because they are not being they, they require AI techniques that are not there. So I think with this I can I can end here. Thank you, Pareza. Thank you for your presentation. Yes. The only thing maybe I would uh, to add is about the next step. So I think we will be concluding on um, uh, on the needs and the uh, and the specific data sources by the end of this year's, and this report will become public. So if there is an interest to read through and discuss uh, in the next year for eventual cooperations or opportunities for specific aspects that we can uh, share knowledge, uh, we would be very happy to do so. Thanks. I mean, uh, apart from the more technical details, so the translation of the policies uh, into indicators and uh, KPIs measured in uh, the domain of cancer, which I think is really, I mean, important that it will be more of focus because we are talking about the pandemic and the COVID-19, but I think that all this uh, part related to cancer will be soon uh, uh, leading uh, the stage. Uh, so that is very important. I really like, uh, I mean, the, the the, the suggestions that you that you had about the synergies we can set in place, not only within the projects, because there are already set in place, but with the stakeholders and, for example, with the audience that is here attending uh, this track. So I would like to give you the floor to Armand Duza. Armand is a senior project manager and research associate at Majoli. Armand is, a, uh, is a responsible for the management and coordination of international research and development and innovation projects co-funded by the European Union under the framework of Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Project. He is particularly specialized in transferring research results into the industry. He has been involved in more than 20 projects in different domains including cloud computing, big data analytics, and cybersecurity. Thank you, Armand, for your presentation. I would like to give you the floor. Thank you, Germana, for the introduction. Uh, I hope you can see my uh, presentation. Yes. OK, cool. Thank you very much. OK, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, as uh, already introduced by uh, Germana, my name is Armin Duja, and I'm a project manager at Majoli. And we are also partner at the Policy Cloud project. And today I'm going to introduce you about the uh, participatory policies to counter and prevent radicalization, which is one of the use cases of the Policy Cloud project. Uh, so to this extent, uh, I am just briefly introduce you the project in order to provide some details in case you are not familiar with all the projects uh, that are part of this clustering activity. So the project started on January 2020 and is going to end uh, next year, uh, end of December. Uh, we are 15 partners and let's say the, the main objective or the, the main, let's say, focus of the project is to provide an integrated cloud-based environment for data-driven policy management that will provide interpretable and reusable models and analytical tools towards efficient policy making. Uh, so, uh, we have, let's say, uh, also, um, so by, uh, we, we are now at the second year of the project and of course, all the results of the project and the outcomes will be, uh, uh, let's say, available uh, by the end of the project, but we have already started our uh, research and development activities. We are at uh, a second uh, stage of uh, validation activities. So we have already performed a second round of uh, piloting activities activities with uh, different stakeholders engaged through the co-creation uh, workshops and uh, relevant activities with the policymakers in the specific domain. Uh, but of course, what we will provide by the end of the project that will be, let's say, uh, available to all the stakeholders, not only policymakers in the, in the sector, but all the relevant stakeholders that might be, uh, let's say, uh, uh, interested in the results of the project. So of course, the, uh, we, we 
we want to enlarge the evidence base for uh, effective policy making to facilitate the interoperability, usability, and scalability. So in terms of data, in terms of uh, uh, functional uh, components that are provided to the policymakers, but also in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, of the sectors and uh, domains that we support or we would like to support uh, uh, in order to provide services and added uh, value uh, benefits to the public services. Also to realize a social centric uh, approach considering legal and uh, ethical, but also security aspect. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, a partner that is uh, specialized in the legal and ethical aspect, who is providing a, a legal and ethical framework for the policy, uh, for the po uh, policy makers. And this will be made available, uh, of course, open source to all the, uh, to all the stakeholders uh, and also, also to promote the data-driven innovation, uh, you know, particularly to the public administration and public sector. And last but not least, to boost the data-driven economy. And uh, in terms of uh, pilot cases that uh, we, uh, let's say, uh, that are part of the project and uh, have been, let's say, um, uh, involved in the project activities uh, in the different phases of the project. So since the uh, project uh, ideation uh, to the uh, to the first stages of the design and prototyping activities. Uh, so we have four use cases in four different uh, sectors. Uh, the first one is about security. Uh, and so this is uh, also the, the focus of the presentation uh, for today. Uh, and uh, this is the, the first use case about policies against radicalization, where, where majority is a technical uh, partner and we have the Lombardy region as the end user for this specific use case. Then we have uh, a second use case about intelligent policies for the food value chain uh, where we have the uh, Itainova as a, technolo uh, as a technolo technological partner and the Aragon region as the end user. And then we have urban policy making uh, for the uh, Sofia municipality in uh, Bulgaria and we have Okis as a technical uh, supporting partner. And last but not least, we have uh, another use case about open data policies for citizens. And for this, we have the uh, city of Candem uh, from London that is, uh, let's say, working on these specific uh, uh, scenarios. And, and as I mentioned, and al also as um, is from the uh, topic of this presentation. So uh, our focus is on the first use case, which is about uh, policies to counter radicalization. And uh, I already specified that for this, so Majoli is collaborating with the Lombardy region as the uh, public entity who is directly involved in the activities. Uh, and uh, what is the purpose of uh, this uh, use case? So why we have, uh, uh, let's say, promoted uh, this use case within the uh, project activities. Uh, so they are different uh... Uh, let's say uh, strategic objectives, but the main ones is of course to reduce the occurrence of radicalization by uh, early identifying warning signals and potential risk from uh, social media uh, networks or other data sources that are available at the uh, premises of the of the public entity or that are available online, uh, and of course to promote the secure access to public spaces for more uh, people by timely adapting cost effective uh, countermeasures. And last but not least, to encourage the citizen engagement and trust in perceived legitimacy of public authorities. So uh, we, of course, we here, we discuss about public authorities at different level because we have stakeholders at the local level. So municipalities, lo uh, local police, but also at the regional level. So we have the regions and other entities that are involved, but also law uh, enforcement agencies and uh, governments. Uh, so what are the challenges that uh, uh, the, the stakeholders are uh, facing, let's say, uh, in this uh, 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 use case? Uh, uh, there are different ones, but the more uh, most important one is, of course, to retrieve and assess the information from different data sources. So as we mentioned before, and we will also see uh, later on a specific list of data sources that are being used to present these outcomes uh, uh, of the analysis by the different AI and machine learning tools uh, by using uh, advanced visualization to 
uh, identify current and future trends and potential risk and threats. So we, we, we discuss about uh, historical data, but we also have uh, prediction capabilities that could uh, uh, already identify potential threats and risk that might be useful for the public entity to know in advance or to know as soon as possible in order to have specific countermeasures. Uh, and also to keep track of people moving from mainstream because as we know right now with the uh, the the in the digital uh, world that we are living uh, the the activities online through the social media are becoming very fast and uh, the communication among uh, these uh, uh, individuals or group of individuals is becoming more fast and so they are not uh, let's say uh, uh, being organized as it was like uh, many years ago but now it is becoming very uh, in real time so also from the public entity it is required uh, a, 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 a more let's say effective and timely response in order to counter these uh, uh, these effects and also try to understand the the coded and uh, hidden language used uh, many times by this uh, let's say individuals or group of individuals uh, uh, in the in the online activities or offline activities uh, so, in terms of data that are being used, so of course there are privately owned data sets by the, the stakeholders, and in this case we have the Lombardy region. There are also open data sets like the Global Terrorism Database and the RAND uh, Database or Worldwide Terrorism Incidents. We have also social, uh, social medias um, that are being tracked uh, in order to identify these individuals and also to, to monitor their activities uh, in uh, the online uh, media. So uh, in this case, we are uh, particularly, uh, let's say, interested, uh, interested in uh, Twitter and Reddit, and but also different blogs and websites that uh, are uh, also uh, available. And uh, with um, RSS feed, we can, uh, uh, let's say, be subscribed to, this, um, to these different portals in order to retrieve in real time information that might be relevant for our stakeholders. So in terms of uh, potential scenarios, application scenarios that are being investigated currently uh, you know, during the second uh, piloting phase, uh, so we have different scenarios. So the first one, uh, of course, is to identify the uh, these incidents uh, and so the uh, where are the the, the areas that are, that are at a higher uh, risk compared to other areas uh, and uh, of course for this we are using the two standardized and uh, very big uh, data sets uh, that are uh, worldwide recognized so we have the global terrorism database and the RAND database of worldwide terrorism incidents and uh, this will be the uh, this is the say the the final outcome that that is presented to the policymaker. So the policymaker, after uh, uh, defining the parameters of the of the or the assessment, so he defines the time that he is interested to to see, uh, uh, let's say, the investigation of the radicalization incidents. He uh, specify the area where the uh, where the analysis should be performed. So it can be Western European countries, Eastern European countries, uh, Asia, or other continents, and then uh, the the user is presented with different filtering activities uh, in order to investigate the specific incident that have occurred. And uh, these two databases provide detailed information for each incident in terms of uh, activities that have occurred, in terms of uh, who was the target, what was the damage in terms of, so of people that might be uh, have been harmed or uh, that, are, uh, that are dead. And all this relevant information are presented to the um, to the policy makers in a let's say very dynamic uh, visualization graph uh, and uh, all the filtering uh, allows him to uh, let's say to go through the different uh, uh, let's say different areas and uh, different uh, uh, hot zones uh, where the the, the major uh, incidents has uh, has happened. Uh, the, another uh, scenario is also very linked to the first one because here, um, from one side we have the uh, in, uh, the radicalization uh, radicalization incident. From the other side, we have the groups or uh, the individuals that are behind these events. So. Uh, uh, 
and in this case, we, we discuss about two types of uh, uh, data. So we, uh, we discuss about historical data. And uh, in this sense, we go, uh, so we use the global terrorism database and the RAN database because uh, they are, um, let's say, um, uh, ma matching uh, the, and uh, let's say, uh, categorizing all the information in a standardized way and present them to all the policymakers. So from this uh, standardized data set, we can uh, identify already a set of uh, individuals or group of individuals that are linked to this uh, specific incident. But also from the online uh, activities uh, through the social media, we can identify also other um, uh, let's say targeted stakeholders that are involved in uh, uh, pro in propaganda spending through uh, online or offline activities. Uh, so this can uh, somehow complement or confirm the the data that are uh, coming from the global terrorism database and the RAN database. And so uh, in, uh, in this case uh, again there is another visualization that uh, uh, graph that present uh, to the stakeholders the different actors that are in, uh, involved and then. Have has been uh, identified uh, based on the parameters that are also specified by the policymakers. And uh, there, so they are uh, categorized in different, let's say, levels. Uh, so if we are talking about uh, only individuals or group of individuals, if they have been involved in violent uh, uh, incidents or non-violent incidents, and also what uh, kind of ideologies that are uh, linked to. So it can be um, religious uh, activities, but they can be also political uh, uh, activities. Uh, so we, we keep track of all this information also based on the, uh, the information that we retrieve from these data sources. And uh, of course, we can also uh, specify in terms of gender of this uh, uh, and age uh, for these um, uh, actors that have been involved. Another Sorry, application... to, to yes. interrupt, yes. we are yeah. running out of time, so I would like to ask... Yeah, these are my Thanks. last two slides, sorry. Uh, and uh, then uh, the, uh, another scenario is about um, uh, understanding the, the trends and uh, uh, let's say the, the future trends, but also the current trends in, in terms of radicalization. Uh, and for this, uh, we are using only uh, uh, data coming from social media. And uh, in this uh, regard, so we use different, uh, let's say capabilities like keyword uh, detection, new entity recognition, uh, uh, new terms uh, uh, identification that um, uh, again uh, based on the parameters that are specified by the policymakers uh, we can present to the uh, let's say to the policymaker what are the uh, let's say the future and the current trends uh, about the radicalization and the last scenario uh, okay i think in the title i have copied it uh, uh, different times uh, the last scenario uh, is about the understanding the uh, under real time, uh, the, the activities of uh, these, um, let's say, individuals and group of individuals that have been uh, identified. And in these terms, uh, we have different capabilities as well. So in terms of sentiment analysis, opinion mining, location surveillance, but also user monitoring. And again, here we are using the data from social media or online platforms, because as we mentioned before, uh, these are data that are coming in real time. Uh, it's very easy easy also to track them and also uh, to, to present them uh, in a very dynamic way to the policymakers in order to keep track of uh, the, the different activities as part of the assessment uh, of their policies that uh, they, they are making through the, the policy cloud system. Uh, okay, so I think this is my last presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Roman. Thanks a lot. Uh, you've presented four very interesting use cases, and uh, we'll believe that I think that reduction of radicalization is certainly part of the well being. Uh, particularly, the part related to the coded in the language is, uh, I would say, interesting because uh, I mean, language is uh, changing, adapting to new technologies, also probably for avoiding the, the, the control. So you open up to a lot of. <laughs> And ethical aspects impacting that I think will be also be part of the next uh, sessions and tracks. Uh, I would like now to give you the floor to Giorgio da Barmida from AI for Public Policy. 
Uh, Giorgio has more than 20 years of international professional experience in European project management and business development before joining GFD, coordinator of the project, where is currently European Programs Executive in charge of new proposal development. He acted for six years as the research and development business uh, development manager for an Italian e-learning company, which is part of Giunti, that is the third largest Italian publisher. He also conducted research in e-learning and mobile learning technologies at the Electronic Systems and Networking Group in the University of Genoa. I will take care of share his presentation, so just give me one moment. Thank you, Germana. There Thank it is. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am uh, fully aware that I am uh, between you and the uh, lunch, so I will be very fast. Uh, I will try to um, uh, describe what we are doing in the AI for Public Policy project, but more from a, a, an integrated point of view instead of giving elements of the project, because I think you might be more interesting in that. Uh, as Germana said, I am uh, uh, working in the European project uh, since over 30 years. Uh, so I really appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity to participate in these initiatives, uh, which have been uh, very important since the beginning of the European Commission. So I thank you also, Germana, for this, because uh, um, in this session, I can also bring different experiences because I'm working for GFT, but also for uh, uh, big companies in uh, healthcare domain like Esaute. So I have been able to bring uh, to, to you uh, a mix uh, uh, set of experiences that I hope uh, you will find uh, interesting. Uh, we live in a, in a very good moment for uh, data-driven uh, society. And the, 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 I discover a mistake in the title, which is the uh, data drive instead of data driven, which is uh, also nice because it will uh, be also true that we are data drive. But uh, uh, what is important is that uh, policy development is really one of the areas where we can make the best use of technologies, enabling technologies uh, that are available. Uh, so uh, this is really one of the uh, fields where uh, we are not uh, a technology push, but uh, we can really enable public authorities uh, to, to develop evidence-based and data-driven uh, policies. Um, the, the ultimate uh, uh, vision that you see here in the slide is what we uh, uh, share in the AI for Public Policy project. So we really would like to use AI and uh, uh, underlying uh, data as a mean to increase the efficiency of policy development and management. So I, it's ambitious, of course, uh, but uh, uh, we need to be ambitious. Uh, so to, to have a more responsive, adaptive, intelligent, and citizen-centric governance. So if you can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, uh, one, one before. Okay. Uh, we, we would like to couple uh, the co-creation and artificial intelligence. What you see on the right side of the slide is uh, uh, basically the, the main, uh, the, the summarization of drivers and motivation of uh, the AI for public policy uh, project. Uh, if uh, we can, uh, uh, there, are, there are a set of uh, elements uh, that, that you can see on the first part of the slide, cloud computing uh, infrastructure, uh, where to, to which you can harvest a vast amount of data. We have high performance computing capabilities. Uh, we, we can uh, uh, put in place cost reductions and improve, in, improve the economies of scale. Uh, we, we can, uh, we have also, we live in a time that we can reduce time to develop and roll out new services. So this uh, basically allows for, um, have a better execution or advanced data analytics uh, uh, over uh, data sets 
And also we can uh, uh, use machine learning and deep learning uh, to have a, a more uh, meaningful insights and actionable insights. So it's next slide. Thank you. Um, uh, here, uh, uh, we in the in the I public policy project, uh, we are keen to use data innovation to collaborate and contribute to the European healthcare um, um, data space, uh, where uh, which is a policy of the Commission that is uh, now under uh, approval, and we hope to see it uh, by uh, beginning of 2022, uh, where we, we it's the it's very in line with what the, the the person from the European Commission said at the beginning in the the plenary speech where it's the, the need for have a, a shared data space is essential to create the meaningful uh, results of uh, the application of uh, AI or other advanced technologies. Um, where in, in the EHDS, uh, we will integrate, in fact, also findings and outcomes uh, of AI for PP project, but also of other projects, hopefully, uh, where uh, this uh, will be a, a, a virtual cycle uh, of uh, improvement of the, of the results. Uh, in the case of the healthcare session, this will, uh, uh, we, we are targeting both the healthcare professionals, but also policymakers to uh, collaborate and create, uh, uh, as you can see here, educated data-driven evidence-based and patient-centric decisions for health prediction and care. This is a, a very ambitious uh, target, but we would like to, to, to go into that direction. Next slide. Okay. Um, no, the the uh, AI for PP is a, is a research project, is a research and innovation project. So we also have a special attention to AI technology innovations uh, like uh, explainable uh, artificial intelligence, uh, federated machine learning, but also uh, AI-based AI healthcare technology assessments. And... Uh, uh, and this is nice because it's uh, patient digital twins in the in the plenary session you have seen uh, the, another another concept of digital twins so about cities uh, and this is a, a very important paradigm uh, that will really uh, create uh, a next generation of uh, 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 solutions and uh, algorithm and uh, uh, um, elaborations based on uh, digital twins. So this is a very important uh, area of research and uh, taken from uh, industry 4.0, of course, but also even even before. Um, the, the 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 key point here is uh, to have uh, highly personalized clinical decisions. Uh, accurate, trusted uh, decision making, uh, especially targeted for policy making, um, which is uh, one of the key point, key targets of the AI for public policy project. Next slide. Um, the the uh, in our in our ambition in the project, we would like to create this uh, virtualized cloud-based platform, uh, which will, uh, uh, base, will be based on the European healthcare data uh, space and other data sets, uh, and uh, enable analytical models, especially targeted for clinical uh, policy makers decision making. Uh, this uh, scheme that you can see here, of course, I will not go into the details because my time is almost up, as I promised, is taken from another project that uh, I can't um, uh, go into details because it's not active yet, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's important to understand that it's an ecosystem of different uh, elements, as uh, uh, one of my colleague uh, speakers said uh, in the previous uh, presentations. So we need uh, uh, the technology can really serve a purpose, uh, not uh, not being a technology push. Uh, let's go to the to the next. Okay, and that's it. That's my contribution to this uh, to this uh, session. I hope you you liked. If you 
uh, need any further information, I remain at uh, your disposal. Thank you, Giorgio. I think uh, uh, there are a couple of points which are uh, really uh, important, I would say. So the uh, whole ecosystem that it is uh, to support of public administration and public policies and also the AI technology innovations that are all set for uh, having an accurate and uh, uh, precise policy making. That is uh, the topic of our discussion today. I would like now uh, to have uh, just a uh, uh, couple of questions for our uh, speakers. Uh, and just let me go back. So what we, uh, I mean, a uh, uh, couple of things that emerge and arise from the discussion of today, uh, for example, I would like to ask, uh, and maybe Pareza, you are uh, the one. Edmana, one second. Yeah. We, we can't see your other presentation because you're just, you're only sharing the presentation that Georgia did. Okay, Sorry. just let me share. Can you share? I think you need to reshare your screen. Can. Now we can, I think, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I would like to ask the speakers to uh, keep the answers short since we ran out of time. But uh, as I said, uh, I mean, and this is for uh, Pareza. Uh, Pareza, what is the situation of the evidence-based policy making in your field? Uh, I mean, what is your uh, opinion and experience on that? Um, okay, uh, as a, um, so I will look at it from the, from the perspective of a, of a practitioner. So someone who, who tries to provide the evidence to the political leaders, uh, be it at national level, European level, or regional level. What, what I mean, when it comes to evidence-based evidence policymaking, we see that there is quite a lot of demand coming from uh, the policymakers themselves. They, they ask explicitly for data. They have a very demanding needs in terms of um, having a, um, timely data, having temporal data, having data at different levels of disaggregation and more granular data when we talk about different technologies. So having a data at the technological level, having data at the more specific domain level that is not a classified database as it exists currently. Think, for instance, of orphan drugs that, that you would like to see in terms of publications, in terms of patents, in terms of activities of companies who dedicate resources on, uh, on orphans or other, other type of uh, more specific domains in terms of climate change. So there is a need for the level of granularity that we don't have in classic uh, data sources. At the same time, there is also a lot of um, um, uh, not, not suspicion, but there is a need to discuss the representativeness of the sources that we are using, of the robustness of the measurements that we produce and how they blend together with other sources, being more traditional data sources, being expert consultations via surveys, via desk research, so that you can actually respond to a policy question, not just to provide a single measurement using big data for which you know very little of in terms of the biases that it, that it may hide. So a very they, they really need to understand how they can best use data that you produce using big data. And if, you do, if you're not able to to, uh, to, to really provide the framework and, and also the robustness checks of what you have been offering to the policymakers, they will also very easily and reasonably so discard it um, in their policymaking process of uh, decision making. It will not be considered, it will be considered as a signal, but not as a concrete ev piece of evidence for policymaking. I think you're muted, uh, Germana. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Marisa. But uh, and in, I mean, in this framework, did you identify the challenges uh, which are, I mean, uh, particularly sensitive? No, the, the the challenges that that we have is that the the policy questions themselves are quite complex, uh, and they do require a complex 
set of data and combination of different things in order to provide a complete answer to the question. So big data can provide a part of the puzzle and very often a very big part of the puzzle, but one cannot pretend that it, it holds the, the, it's the holy grail. So that's, that's a bit the way I see it, but, it's, uh, uh, but it, it comes, it meets the needs that are really there. So we have a lack of data and, and AI techniques and, and open big data come to fill that gap. But we have still a long way to go translating the, um, the, that data and the AI techniques and what comes out of it to policy knowledge. So there are still a lot of uh, work to do, but luckily we have, uh, uh, I mean, the possibility also with the European funds and these research and innovation projects to uh, come up and, uh, I mean, improve definitely the situation, I would say. Do you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, it's uh, it's exciting times. I must say. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Well, Armand, I, I mean, I mean, you you talk about for pilots, especially the pilot in radicalization. I mean, which is uh, uh, really interesting, and uh, we all see the importance that it has in the uh, I mean, uh, uh, European uh, uh, area, for example. And uh, but I mean, there are there. Um, particular uh, topics or interests uh, and aspects that uh, you think uh, that are important for the replication of your project and for the assessment of the activities in Europe? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Germana, for the question. I, I think like if we talk about the specific use case, so uh, we know as we are aware, like radicalization is a phenomenon that is country, let's say Europe uh, wise, is not country specific. Uh, so every experience that we can share between the European member states, uh, it is more than, uh, let's say, welcome because like all the um, activities or all the uh, side effects that are coming due to the radicalization uh, in one specific country, they can of course also be linked to other uh, countries like neighborhood countries, but also other countries that have this, the same specific in terms of demographic, in terms of uh, economic development. And uh, I think it is really important that we have countries that they are working together in order to counter uh, this phenomena as soon as possible, as, as fast as possible. Because as we said before, like the, the these individuals and this group of individuals are moving very fast compared that uh, what they were doing, uh, uh, like if we went to compare it in like in five of years, uh, 10 years before. And also the, the development of the technology has also uh, uh, made them uh, very easy to communicate also through the different countries and also to, uh, to spread uh, this propaganda uh, through the different countries in a more uh, fast way, but also like using uh, probably also a language that uh, before it was not possible because everything has to be organized in small groups groups or in small context and now it is uh, so th there is, uh, for from their side, there is a plethora of opportunities because the World Wide Web has uh, given them this opportunity also to move from one country to another, like be, um, uh, without uh, moving physically, but the, what their opinions and their ideas can move uh, Qu uh, quickly from one country to another country. So I think it is very important that if we can share uh, experiences uh, also in terms of data sets that uh, uh, probably like uh, one entity has uh, in Italy compared to another entity uh, within the same uh, country or within the same uh, uh, region, but also in other countries, I think it is very important and uh, very useful from the European context. And so this uh, of course, can uh, can bring benefits to all European citizens. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Armand. Uh, one question. Uh, I mean, uh, Giorgio, you talk about the um, evidence-based policy making from different points of view. I mean, uh, different uh, uh, areas, uh, public administration or uh, large and um, companies. Uh, uh, what would be your recommendation to policymakers uh, in order to um, have them uh, basing their decision on uh, evidence-based policy making, of course, uh, based on technology? 
Uh, thanks for the question. Um, um, I, uh, the answer is uh, twofold. On one hand, uh, I would uh, uh, advise, recommend to uh, base uh, um, decisions uh, to uh, adopt or to uh, being, uh, let's say, advised by advanced technology or evidence-based uh, data using uh, standard and shared uh, data sets in order to have an um, unbiased uh, point of view, like the European uh, health uh, data space uh, that uh, I also put in the chat the link to the to the standard and to the initiative so that you can have a look is uh, quite interesting. And the second is uh, to um, keep the uh, technology uh, advice, advices as advices because the, uh, we, we, we can help policymakers uh, give them uh, uh, a wealth of information uh, selected and uh, very specific for their needs, but uh, the uh, policies and the policymakers need to keep, uh, uh, to stay in the center of the process. So uh, the, the technology can be helpful, can give a good advice better than uh, before ever, but uh, uh, it, it is still uh, the policy making is still a, a human uh, activity, which keeps which uh, needs to stay human, but uh, with with the wealth of information as many information as possible. Thank you, Giorgio. But I also think that all these events can uh, surely uh, improve the fact. Uh, improve the participation and uh, willingness of different stakeholders uh, to effectively uh, take part uh, to this uh, decision-making uh, process. So I think they're really useful and uh, really helpful in, the, in this field. I would like to thank you all, uh, the speakers and uh, the organizers for having us. Sorry for running a little bit late, but I hope the audience has been interested by our topic. And thank you all. And uh, thank you for chairing the session. <laughs> I, be I believe that we have a little bit more time. Um, yeah, the recommendations from the three tracks starts at 1.30. So we do have a little bit more time if there are some more panel questions. Another we 10 minutes. Time. Yes, not stopping at one. Okay. I, I was looking in the chat, but uh, I cannot see. Uh, maybe there is any any question from the participants. Maybe. Any question from the audience? I have, I have one comment that I can add uh, for, for uh, enriching the discussion. Uh, I would, uh, I would uh, suggest uh, to um, uh, also to, to this uh, exercise, this uh, very nice uh, cluster uh, to uh, become or to stay part of the wider ecosystem of the European Commission or European uh, Union initiatives like, uh, for example, the Big Data Value Association, uh, now is, is the name is DIRO, uh, which, I mean, joining efforts also in terms of uh, making synergies between uh, different clusters or different groups can, can enrich a discussion uh, and the, the outcomes can be then cross-fertilized and uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the results of the one discussion can uh, uh, nurture the uh, discussion in the other group, and then we can see more projects uh, uh, burning, we, we can see more initiatives uh, and more discussions, which is the, 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 the one of the biggest uh, values uh, of the European uh, Union, basically. Okay, I'm just checking the chat. Uh, thank you, Giorgio, for sharing the link um, to the initiative. Uh, 
No questions from the audience? So thank you very much. And have a nice lunch. <laughs> we'll be back in the afternoon for the next sessions. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody.